Good morning, good morning, sir. Good morning, sir. Ah, let us start uh, today's uh, topic. First of all, I shall discuss about the embryology of kidneys and ureter and its anomalies. And in the later part, if possible, I shall finish the renal trauma also. Okay. So first, let us start with the embryology of kidneys. During during the embryonic life, the mesoderm, intraembryonic mesoderm, divides into three different portions. The medial most forming a somite, and lateral part is the intermediate mesoderm, and in between these two, we'll get the in intermediate mesoderm and in the lateral aspect we will get the intraembryonic phylum okay this intermediate mesoderm this one this intermediate mesoderm and cloaca plays an important role in the development of the urogenital system this intermediate mesoderm uh, forms a bulging forms a bulging on the posterior abdominal wall by the side by the side of the mesenteric attachment over the posterior abdominal wall this is the mesenteric gut developing gut it is having a mesentery which is attached over the posterior abdominal wall by the two sides of this attachment of the mesentery this intermediate mesoderm this intermediate mesoderm this intermediate mesoderm forming a bulge and this bulge is known as is called nephrogenic cord okay this nephrogenic cord this nephrogenic cord extends from the from the cervical region to the sacral region, developing sacral vertebral part. And the part of the nephrogenic cord, which is, which is lying in the cervical region is known as pronephros. This part, which is lying in the cervical region is known as pronephros. And the part of this nephrogenic cord which is lying in the thoracolumbar region is known as metanephros this part this part is the metanephros and part of this nephrogenic cord which is lying in the sacral region this part is known as metanephros right so this is all part of the nephrogenic cord extending from the cervical region to the sacral region the portion of it which is lying in the sacral region is the pronephros portion of this nephrogenic cord which is lying in the metanephros uh, in the thoracolumbar region is known as meta mesonephros and part of the nephrogenic cord which is lying in the sacral region is known as metanephros right This pronephros, which is lying in the sacral region, is non-functional in the human being and it disappears. But this some nephric duct forms in relation to this pronephros and ending in the cloaca, which will persist. The mesonephros, which is lying in the in the thoracolumbar region consists of a series of excretory tubules series of excretory tubules and these tubules drains into the nephric duct and and this nep and now after this this is now called mesonephric duct or olfian duct most of the mesonephric duct disappears but some some of this mesonephric duct will take part in the formation of the duct system of testes. 
right? Then a diverticula arises arises from the lower part of the mesonephric duct. Here you see, go to the previous slide. This is the mesonephric duct. This is the mesonephric duct. From the lower part of the mesonephric duct, a diverticula, a diverticula arises, and this diverticula is known as ureteric part, right? A diverticula arises from the lower part of the mesonephric duct is known as ureteric part. Now, this kidney, kidney arises from the two distinct sources. One is mesonephric blastoma and next is the ureteric part. You again go to the previous slide here. This from this mesonephric blastoma and ureteric blood, but which is arising from this mesonephric duct diverticula this from this mesonephric blastoma mesonephros and ureteric bud will our kidney will develop right so this kidney is having mainly two different portion one is excretory portion another is collecting system excretory system and the collecting system excretory system is the nephrons and neph hello the nephrons are the are the structural and functional unit of the kidney and these nephrons the excretory tubules which are known as nephrons actually derived from this metanephros go to the previous slide again this metanephros this excretory part of the kidney, that means nephron, the functional unit of kidney is being developed from this metanephros, right? From metanephros. You see, this is the part of the metanephros, okay? Part of the metanephros, so first there will be dilatation, forming the ampulla, then it will further dilate, will form the vesicles, then the different shape will air shape it, and then there will be different angulation and develop for the development and ultimately they will form the uh, renal capsules, glomerulus, then PCT, huh? PCT proximal convoluted tubules, then loop of then loop of Henley loop of Henley, distal convoluted tubule and other. Okay, so these nephrons of excretory, excretory system, excretory part will develop from the metanephros. Okay, and the, another portion, another part of the kidney, which is the collecting part, collecting part, what are the collecting part of kidney? These are the ureter, pelvis and the calyces. Okay, so if you see this, this diagram, these are the calyces, different calyces. These are the major calyces, minor calyces, pelvis, then ureter. So these, all these things collectively known as collecting part of the kidney. So this portion developed from the, as I have mentioned earlier, and this part will develop from the ureteric part, ureteric part, okay. So this is the ureteric bud, and this is the ureteric bud. Huh? Here you will get here you will get the metanephric tissue, and from this metanephric tissue, these excretory tubules that means nephrons will develop, and this ureteric bud here they will go on division, different division. So initially they will divide and will form the pelvis and the major calyces here ureteric by dividing into various generation of branches and will form the major calyces and the minor calyces okay and pelvis and the ureter so this will develop from the ureteric part okay what we have already mentioned 
okay so this kidney this metanephros is actually i have i have told you this part of the uh, is, is lying in the sacral region is is developing in the sacral part of the developing em, em, embryo okay and then gradually between 5 to 8 weeks of intrauterine life this each kidney in each side of the vertebral column uh, they ascend ascend go up from the sacral region they will go up into the up to the lumbar region right the and initially the hilum hilum means through which this this uh, the vessels are entering inside the kidney and the pelvis is coming out this hilum at the beginning during the development is actually facing anteriorly and then gradually rotates and faces medially okay what we have discussed already in the previous class so this is the in short this is the development of the kidney and ureter right so if there is any problem during this developing process of, of this the, the the in the either in the metanephros or in the uh, in the ureteric bud or in the uh, during the process of ascent uh, there will be some anomaly will get some anomaly in, uh, in 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 the uh, patient okay so what are these congenital anomalies of the kidney there are so many congenital anomalies but we will we'll, we'll just discuss some important particularly important one particularly we shall discuss in in details about the hot socket which is very common so in some patient we will get uh one kidney may be absent in any side and you know very well we have discussed in the last class a patient a person can survive very well with with a with a single functioning kidney so from the birth itself uh, there may be absence of one kidney okay and patient may not have any symptoms only it will be detected when you will go for the some investigation for other reason and incidentally you will will, will diagnose that this patient your patient is having uh, absence of one kidney either in the right or in the left okay so this is incidental finding patient will not have any problem in in that to be activity then is the ectopic kidney what does it mean that means when the kidney is not not in the normal position during the ascent as i have mentioned during the fifth or eighth fifth to eighth eight intrauterine in life this this uh, developing kidney will ascends from the lumbar to the uh, from the sacral to the lumbar region so there may be arrest there they may remain in the sacrum region uh, sacral region or in, in the any part of the any part of the path so this may be unilateral or this may be bilateral also so ectopic kidney means is the failure to ascend due to any reason and we will get one in 1000 population and usually this ectopic kidney you will find find near the pelvic brim and this ectopic kidney may be on the same side that means one kidney has not ascend it may remain in the opposite side or in it, it may in the same side of okay so may be on the proper side when it uh, remain in the same side there suppose right kidney could not ascend to the right lumbar region but in the, it is in the in the right uh, right sacral or right pelvic region so that means it is remaining in the proper side or it may be in the opposite side suppose right kidney left kidney has uh, uh, this to its original position but right kidney has not ascends 
but it is remaining in the left side left uh, either in the pelvic green or into the sacrum or okay in the uh, lower part of the lumbar region okay so it may be uh, remain in the opposite side ectopia may be in the opposite side which is known as crossed ectopia crossed ectopia right so next is the next is a very important anomalies of kidney often you will get is known as horseshoe kidney horseshoe kidney what you will get in horseshoe kidney here this lower pole of two functional kidneys both the kidneys are functional are fused with each other in the midline that means uh, uh, consist in in, in horseshoe kidney what will get it consists two distinct functioning kidneys one each side both the kidney are remaining in the uh, both sides of the midline and they are connected with each other at the lower pole and this connecting portion is known as ethmus this connecting portion is known as ethmus this, this i am representing it with the uh, wrist okay so this wrist this is the ethmus this this part is the kidney the, the both the kidney are remaining in the both side of the midline and they are both the kidneys are functioning both the kidneys are functioning and attached with each other in the midline okay and this attaching portion is known as ethmus and usually it is it is this ethmus is also consists of functioning renal parenchyma functioning renal tissue okay sometimes it is this ethmus is represented by fibrous tissue okay what is the incidence we we'll usually we will get one in 400 live but and it is more common twice as common in male male in male patient will get uh, it is common twice as common in the male here you see this is the horseshoe kidney this is the horseshoe kidney you see it okay the here lower pole is being connected with each other and it is this portion is known as ethmus here you see though i shall i shall discuss about it here you see this is the anterior portion what anterior view we are we are showing in this picture this is the anterior view and here this is the this is the renal pelvis this is the ureter okay this is the renal pelvis which is very dilated this is the ureter and you see this ureter and the pelvis the pelvis is anteriorly placed and ureter is coming downwards over the ethmus that means it is not posteriorly placed as we have discussed in the normal uh, anatomy uh, arrangement in the hilum here the pelvis is anteriorly placed and ureter is coming in front of the ethmus right so okay, we shall we shall discuss it. okay so this normal ascents of kidney is impeded by the uh, so what will happen when there the uh, the most medial subdivision of the mesonephric uh, tissues uh, fuses together what will happen uh, after fusion this developing kidney will ascends from the sacral region to the lumbar region so they are fused here and at the same time in the developing embryo all these vessels midline vessels big big vessels abdominal aorta inferior vena cava all these are also developing and you know from the abdominal aorta different midline branches are arising one is in the uppermost branch is the celiac trunk then superior mesentery then inferior mesentery okay they all these are arising from the middle uh, midline branches not the side branches okay so when the kidney is suppose kidney is developing here in the sacral region but when they usually they remain isolated from one another so easily they can ascend to the lumbar region but when they are fused in the lower pole so 
after fusion nothing will happen but in the development but when they will ascend up during the ascent they cannot go further up uh, they cannot go to their original position because this it when this it must will come close to the inferior mesentery artery this inferior mesentery artery will not allow this kidney to go further up so it will remain there it will be arrested here in the region of the inferior mesentery artery is it clear so this horseshoe kidney will always remain in the lumbar region uh, that means in the l4 l4 vertebral region this it must is and and this it must where it will lie it this it must will lie over this structure what is this this is the abdominal aorta big vessels okay here and it must just will come in contact with the inferior mesentery artery and it will lie in front of the big vessel abdominal aorta okay because of this inferior mesentery artery it cannot go further up to its normal position okay so this is also another type of ectopic pregnancy uh, okay uh, not pregnancy ectopic kidney sorry uh so it must lies anterior to the great vessels at the lumbar four vertebra this is not the normal position of the kidney. you know already the normal position of the kidney which we have discussed in the last class in detail so this vascular supply obviously as it is remaining lower down than its original position so this was vessels may originate from the aorta or the iliac artery or the inferior mesentery artery okay so this horseshoe kidney commonly what will happen what will get there will be a true pelvic ureteric junction obstruction and this obstruction pelvic ureteric junction obstruction is due to high insertion of ureter into the renal pelvis suppose this is the renal pelvis this is the pelvis dilated part ureter is inserted here in the higher up position so obviously it will not drain properly there will be little bit of uh, there will be obstruction in this region okay so this obstruction is pelvic ureteric obstruction is because of the high insertion of the ureter into the renal pelvis okay and already i have mentioned mentioned the crossing of ureter over the it must may also contribute to the obstruction let us see the previous diagram here here you see this is the pelvis of the kidney okay and this ureter is is actually not from the lower most portion of the pelvis it is inserted higher up here okay let us restart okay so this obstruction pelvic ureteric obstruction mainly due to high up insertion of the ureter into the pelvis and this obstruction is also due to the as this ureter is passing over the it must because some structures some, a bulk of tissues is behind the ureter so it is also obstruct the uh, drainage of urine uh, through the ureter okay okay so if a patient is having uh, horseshoe kidney what are the symptoms you will get uh, actually one third of this patient are asymptomatic asymptomatic patient one third of the patient are asymptomatic and symptoms are usually due to as i have mentioned 
uh, in horseshoe kidney there will be some obstruction in the pelvic ureteric obstruction so these symptoms two third of the patient will have symptoms just because of the obstruction obstruction of what obstruction obstruction of urine flow and uh, in the pelvic ureteric junction and following obstruction what will happen there will be stone formation and infection so two third of the patient will have symptoms because of the obstruction and the stone formation or the following infection of the urinary tract okay so in the children will present with uti and adult patient will uh, mainly present with the pain uh, pain so how you will investigate this horseshoe kidney so actually this horseshoe kidney is a radiological diagnosis or incidentally you may you, you may diagnose this horseshoe kidney or some of the patient may present with the symptoms of uh, obstructions or the uh, symptoms of stone or the infection so when you will go for the in, in, investigation uh, radiology particularly radiological investigation you will see this patient will have have horseshoe kidney and uh, you can diagnose it with, with ct scan or renal uhg and if you go for the ivu what you will see the most lower calyx most lower calyx is pointing caudally and medially caudally means towards the head and medially and this is known as hand joining side or handshake side and this high insertion of ureter as i have mentioned is draping out over the mid midline it must and this is known as flower basket uh, flower bath sign okay this is the ibu urogram of a horseshoe kidney here you see all the calyces are medi uh, facing medially and this is of course rare but in in most of the cases what you will see the only the lower calyx medially means towards the spinal column actually these calyces are actually face laterally towards the huh? lateral aspect but in horseshoe kidney the mostly the lower calyx will face medially and upward okay but here this is also a ibu of the uh, horseshoe kidney and you see this is the sacral part sacrum that means kidney is much lower down in the lumbar region okay this is the lumbar one by two the two by second by two the. so much lower down position kidney is here much lower down position and calyces are facing medially and upwards right so what treatment actually horseshoe kidney doesn't require any treatment but if not if there is no complication so if there is any complication so then only you are to treat it so why com complication or the, the symptoms occurs because of the obstruction i have mentioned this patient will have two pelvic ureteric junction obstruction so to treat if a patient having some complication following this uh, pelvic ureteric obstruction then what you have to do, do either if there is stone you have to go for the pyelolithotomy and if there is two obstruction you have to reconstruct it what is the reconstruction you have to reconstruct the pelvic ureteric junction and this is known as pyeloplasty pyeloplasty okay either you have to go for the pyeloplasty or pyelolithotomy and remember We, we don't go for the division of the isthmus we do not try to reposition the kidney to its original position it will remain in its lower down position we will not go for the removal of the isthmus because it is not at all required only we will treat the complication by pyeloplasty or pyelolithotomy okay and first is the best surgical approach we will approach this this kidney from the lateral aspect left 
retroperitoneal approach is the preferred surgical approach and only indication where we will we'll, we'll divide the ethmus when there is there is aortic aneurysm abdominal aortic aneurysm in the same patient if you that the aortic aneurysm and if you want to treat if you want to operate uh, this aortic aneurysm then of course you have to you have to you have to divide the ethmus of this horseshoe patient otherwise otherwise you will not do any operation over the ethmus so you will not divide the ethmus so what is the prognosis a person can survive very well with horseshoe kidney without any any much problem only thing is they may develop some symptoms complications of infection stone and if there is uh, evidence of uh, pelvic obstruction we will go for the pyeloplasty if there is stone we will go for the pyelolithotomy and we will treat the infection otherwise this is uh, very much compatible to normal life and even with horseshoe kidney uh, a, a patient can can have uh, the normal pregnancy and delivery it is com it will not complicate uh, this horseshoe kidney will not complicate the pregnancy or the delivery okay and it doesn't affect the survival of the patient right next is the uh, let us finish within few minutes next is the renal trauma uh, renal trauma is very very important nowadays trauma is very very one of the leading cause of death so 10% of any trauma trauma cases involve the genito urinary tract out of all trauma cases 10% will have injury over the genito urinary tract right and this urinary trauma is mostly blunt trauma blunt trauma blunt trauma is much more common than the there are two types of injury there may be two types of injury this renal trauma may be blunt following blunt trauma or it may be penetrating trauma. but remember blunt trauma is the most common than the penetrating trauma okay and uh, how this blunt trauma occurs this blunt trauma results actually occurs following road traffic accident there may be renal trauma following fall maybe following assault or following sports injury and all these things will lead to blunt trauma huh? and injury to the kidney okay penetrating injuries are usually knife or uh, knife or gunshot injury okay and these closed renal injuries are almost always extra pain closed means blunt trauma when there is blunt trauma over the over the kidney injury to the kidney is you know these kidneys are retroperitoneal or extraperitoneal structure and following this blunt trauma or the closed leading to closed renal injuries are always extraperitoneal it will not usually will not extend to the peritoneal tube and there may be different grades of injury and this degree of renal injury there is considerably from grade 1 to grade 5 okay so we have to know what is grade 1 renal injury what is grade 2 grade 3 grade 4 and grade 5 you see this diagram there are five different pictures of kidney first one is the grade 1 here this is the normal kidney 
Okay. This is the capsule, renal capsule. Okay. Here you will get only subcapsular hematoma. There is no laceration, only contusion is there. Following renal contusion, you know contusion and laceration. There is no laceration of this kidney, only contusion. And following contusion, there may be a small hematoma. And this hematoma is subcapsular, below the capsule of the kidney. Subcapsular hematoma, right? So if you get, obviously it is, it is not the clinical diagnosis. This reading is not clinical. You have to take the help of radiology. So they will tell you whether there is laceration or contusion and the degree of the hematoma. So this is subcapsular hematoma. Only contusion is there, no laceration. So if you get this sort of injury, it is grade one. Next is the grade two injury. Here there is a laceration and this laceration involving the renal parenchyma, but this laceration depth of the lacerated wound is less than one centimeter. It is less than one centimeter. Okay. And there will be hematoma formation. Hematoma formation. It is not extending to the uh, collecting system. These are the collecting system. Okay. It is not extending to the collecting system. Okay. And 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 this hematoma is uh, is not expand uh, 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 not expanding, okay. So if you get this sort of injury, where uh, they will mention there is laceration of renal parenchyma less than one centimeter, and this laceration is not involving the collecting system of the kidney, and there is hematoma, and it is which is not expansive. Or not expanding further, so this sort of you can level it as grade two. This is grade three. What is grade three injury? When we level it grade three injury, when there is laceration more than one centimeter, laceration more than one centimeter, right? And this is extending, uh, not extending to the renal. Uh, Calices or the pelvic, pelvic, pelvic calicial system. These are the pelvic calicial system. So, if there is no extension to the pelvic calicial system, obviously uh, th there will not be any leakage of this urine. That, that means there will not be any extravasation of the urine here. But as there is laceration more than one centimeter, okay, quite big. Laceration and following this kidney is very vascular, there will be a big hematoma here. Okay, big hematoma. So, this sort of injury, if you get this sort of injury, we will level it grade 3. Then, what is grade 4? Grade 4 extensive laceration of the renal parenchyma, and, and this laceration is involving this laceration is involving this collecting system these are the collecting system yes these are the collecting system so here is the laceration is extending up to the collecting system so as this laceration is extending up to collecting system what will happen the urine which is being formed collected here will come out through this lacerated wound here in this so there will be extravasation of urine and there will be there may be some injury endothelial injury over the renal vessels particularly segmental vessels here there may be some injury over the renal vessel there may be clot formation or clot formation following endothelial injury so if there is clot formation there may be uh, necrosis uh, there may be necrosis of a particular segment of the kidney. And as this laceration is extending, involving the uh, collecting system, and there will be extravasation, so there is, here you will get a big hematoma. And when there is big hematoma, and as I mentioned, it is always, mostly it is, it is extra peritoneal. So it is within a closed cavity. So there will be compression 
there will be compression over the kidney okay next grade is the grade 5 injury when you will call it grade 5 injury it is shattered kidney extensive lacerated injury completely shattered or there may be complete injury over the renal vessel avulsion injury over the hilum of the kidney complete injury of the kidney right so these are the different grades of the renal injury right so when a patient having the renal uh, the, the, uh, renal injury following blunt trauma okay what will be the presentation history of fall or rta or sports injury will get and uh, some patient will have some external bruises over the lumbar region okay uh, but remember uh, there may not be any 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 external uh, signs of any injury okay some patient will have some pain over the over the lumbar uh, lumbar region and there may be a tenderness but one very 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 important symptom is hematuria hematuria is the cardinal sign of damaged kidney okay sometimes some patient might have delayed hematuria because uh, actually there may be it may be uh, injury over the renal parenchyma leading over the collecting systems and these may form a clot there and this clot will stop the bleeding but again there may be dislodgement of the clot and the patient will have again bleeding again hematuria and this is known as delayed hematuria and usually occurs on the third day third day to third week of week after the injury and as i mentioned there may be clot formation and clot will pass with along with the, with the urine and this clot may remain and may obstruct the urine flow in the ureter and when there is ureteric obstruction by a clot this patient will have a clot colic ureteric colic following the due to this clot okay we have discussed in the last class okay and as there will be massive there may be massive injury over the kidney and some follow, there will be massive bleeding and following massive bleeding this patient might have uh, features of shock so when you suspect your patient is having uh, might have uh, this renal injury how will you investigate so you see already i have mentioned radiological investigation is the most important investigation and uh, when we will go for the radiological investigation and remember before going for the investigation remember two things the injury which are mostly this renal injury are following blunt trauma okay and uh, this blunt trauma injury or renal injury are the self limiting mostly we will treat it conservatively self limiting injury only 5 to 10% of blunt trauma and 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 uh, about 70% of penetrating trauma uh, are, uh, are are major injury remember five to ten percent of blunt trauma are ma are major injuries remaining are minor injuries out of blunt trauma but most common trauma is the blunt trauma penetrating trauma is very less and if you get the penetrating trauma 70 percent of this penetrating trauma are usually major trauma major will lead to major injury to the kidney so when we will send for the investigation radi radiological assessment what are the indication for radiological assessment so any patient of any as we will get 70 percent of penetrating injuries are major injury so we will we'll go for the after the initial initial management that means a treating shock and other things okay uh, we, 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 after stabilizing this patient, we will send for the investigation. When? 
if a patient is having penetrating injury, penetrating injury, because most of the penetrating injury, 70% of the penetrating injury are the major injury. When there is gross hematuria, gross hematuria, even a, a blunt trauma, when patient is having gross massive hematuria, patient presenting with shock, with microscopic hematuria, and in children, because in children, this abdomen is quite big, and protective phenomenon is uh, not adequate. So what investigation will do? What is the choice of investigation? Is the contrast city. Contrast city is the investigation of the Why? Because it will give you the accurate diagnosis. They will, this contrast city will tell you the extent of injury, the, whether there is extravasation of urine or not. Huh? That means extravasation of urine means for what? That the injury has involved the, in, involved the collecting system of the, uh, of the kidney. That means calyx or pelvis, okay? Major or minor calyx, okay? It will also tell about about the external bleeding. External means to the surrounding bleeding. What, uh, what is the uh, amount of or the size of the hematoma around the around the kidney? Okay, it will tell about the vessels, about the renal vessels or the segmented vessels, whether there is any injury or the clot formation in the vessels. And it will also tell about about the non-renal injury. That means whether there is any any injury to the other organ. Okay, and it will. Uh, Tell about the renal pedicle injury, right? So they, they will mention all these things. So that's why we will go for the contrast CT. And what is the treatment after getting this patient of the renal trauma? Most of the renal trauma patients are coming following blunt trauma. And I have mentioned the most of the blunt trauma are having minor injury, only 5 to 10 percent are having major injury. So most of the patient will treat conservative, conservative treatment. But remember, as I've mentioned, 70% of the penetrating injuries are major injury, will go for the investigation and may require uh, exploration. Most of the penetrating injury may require renal exploration. So initially what we, we have to do, patient coming with renal injury and symptoms of renal injury. So there is bleeding, so IV, IV, IV drip. We have to start it. Patient might uh, maybe uh, maybe in shock, so we have to treat it. So IV fluid we have to start. We have to go. We have to send this blood for ABO and garage grouping, and in some cases we have to go for the blood transfusion. And what is most important, we have to keep the patient in bed. We have to keep the patient in bed. Absolute bed rest. Absolute bed rest means there should not be any extra movement of the patient. Okay, uh, and for that you might have to go for the sedatives and the strong analgesic, so that patient doesn't move in the bed. If he move gone moving his uh, trunk, so there will be following injury. There will be clot formation, and if he moves vigorously, this clot will dislodge, and there will be further bleeding. So. Patient should be confined to the bed if required, or mostly we have to go for the sedatives and strong analgesics like morphine. Morphine will be given to the patient. We will monitor the patient by pulse and DP chart, and we will start an antibiotic to this patient. So when we will go, so this is the conservative treatment. Most of the patient will, will recover following conservative treatment, but some patient will require surgical exploration. When? When will go for the surgical exploration? As I have mentioned, most of the penetrating injury, 70% of penetrating injury, uh, having major injury, we have to go for the surgical exploration. And unstable major injuries, that means the uh, some closed injuries, 5 to 10% of the blunt trauma or the closed injury uh, will, will require the uh, they, are, uh, they are as they are unstable, 
having unstable major injury, we have to go for the exploration. And when we are treating a patient conservatively, but uh, but there is there is expanding hematoma or pulsated retroperitoneal hematoma. When this hematoma is expanding on radiological subsequent investigation, this hematoma is exp expanding further or it is becoming pulsatile, then we have to go for the surgical exploration. So what is the aim of this surgical exploration? What, what we will do? Main aim of the surgical exploration is to stop bleeding. Stop bleeding once and remember whilst going for the stoppage of the bleeding, we have to conserve the renal tissue as far as possible. We have to con conserve the renal tissue. Okay? Not to remove the renal, un unnecessary uh, removal of the renal tissue is to be avoided. So, what should be the approach? Transperitoneal approach. And why transperitoneal approach? Because you have to see whether there is any other injury to the intra abdominal organs. But what is the danger of the, of the surgical approach? I have mentioned most of the renal injuries are closed injuries. They, they will form a tamponade. This clot will form a tamponade. They will press over the injured part of the kidney. So this pressing, you know, when there is bleeding, best way to stop bleeding is the pressure. So as it is in this bleeding is occurring into a closed part, retroperitoneal portion is the closed part. So this clot will, will press over the injured part of the kidney and will stop bleeding. But when you will go for the surgical exploration, you will cut the peritoneum, you will go reflect the peritoneum, you will go to the retroperitoneal space. From the intraperitoneal to the retroperitoneal space. So this tamponading effect will, uh, will not remain further. So what will happen? As pressure will be released. So there will be torrential bleeding, torrential massive bleeding in the surgical explosion. Oh, the, the surgeon should be ready, ready for this torrential bleeding. Okay. So what to do? In some cases where the kidney is completely shattered, hilum is the renal vessels already destroyed. So and then you have to uh, you have to go for the nephrectomy. If you go ahead, I'm finishing. Uh, I'm finishing. Uh, if there is small tear, you can go for the suturing. Uh, if large tear, you can put a nephrostomy tube and repair over it. Uh, and sometimes you have to go for the partial nephrectomy. But if you get a solitary kidney, then uh, uh, and uh, and this solitary kidney is being damaged then uh, it should be repaired you cannot remove it okay so sometimes we may, uh, may take the help of uh, interventional radiology uh, where they will go for the embolization of the bleeding vessel and uh, keep the kidney function okay so with this uh, let us uh, conclude here and